1929 was the worst economic depression in modern history. It saw banks fail, soup lines, crippling unemployment, and a decline in worldwide GDP by over 15%. For context, the 2008 mortgage crisis and the ensuing recession caused a drop in worldwide GDP of just 1%. So yeah, this was bad. It was also marred by a lot of bad policies because it was a time when modern economies as we know them today had only really just begun operating and nobody knew how to drive them just yet. The Great Depression and all the theories surrounding it deserve a video all of their own, which will be coming out in the next few weeks. But what I want to focus on for today is what put an end to the economic decline. Students of history will probably say, well, this is so simple, it was World War II. And this kind of makes sense on paper. World War II, all over the world saw factories built, literal armies of people employed, infrastructure projects funded, and governments throw budgets to the side and effectively create the biggest stimulus ever, all in the name of winning the war. The economics of war are just as true today as they were back in the 1940s. The United States is the largest economy in the world, which also has the largest military budget in the world. Its largest employer is Walmart, and then it's the armed forces. Military policy in a sense is as intertwined with economic policy as income tax and interest rates. But this begs the question, is war actually good for the economy? If it worked in the 1940s, what's to stop it working now? Well, as always, let's start from the very, very beginning with how defense spending actually helps an economy. When governments are assessing the health and prosperity of an economy, they will look at a few key indicators. Things like GDP figures, growth rates, inflation, unemployment, and even major share market prices are all good indicators of the overall health of a nation. Because politics is politics, it often becomes a top priority of governments to make these figures look as good as possible, even if the reality is a little bit less pretty. Unemployment, for example, is often a big ticket item that directly impacts elections. Now, the correct way to lower unemployment rates is to ensure that the economy is growing at a healthy rate in line with or exceeding population growth, and that a healthy service sector is maintained to employ lots and lots of people in good paying jobs. Now, let's say you are a less than totally honest world leader coming up to an election with poor employment figures. What do you do? Well, a big loophole in this particular indicator is that the definition of employment is any individual working for at least one hour per week. So yeah, if you are working one, one hour shift at a McDonald's a week, guess what? You are employed. Lucky you. An employer like McDonald's can employ far more people working casual rosters than it can employ full-time employees, even if the net result is the same amount of hours. The side effect of this is that suddenly this fast food chain isn't employing 10 people, it's employing 30 people on a variable roster. On a nationwide level, this actually looks great for unemployment figures, but this is why economic indicators all need to be taken with a grain of salt. The case of underemployment, that is workers who are employed but are actively seeking more hours, is a huge issue in most modern economies today. Now there are also other ways around this whole issue to make your unemployment figures look better. For example, you can change the definition of unemployment to not include certain types of people, like students. Or you can just employ more people in the government. There are lots of government agencies that need good employees, of course. Teachers, infrastructure workers, parks and recreation managers. But of course, a big one is the military. Military recruitment in a lot of countries is intense and sometimes even mandatory. Normally, this is not because the military is desperately lacking personnel, but rather because the armed forces are a great opportunity for young men and women to not only achieve gainful employment, but also normally to obtain some kind of skill or training. The military is a giant form of welfare that employs hundreds of thousands of young men and women that would otherwise have to find employment in increasingly automated and outsourced entry-level jobs. So this sounds like a good thing overall. The extra benefit, of course, is that you have a strong and well-manned military to ensure that your nation's interests are protected at home and abroad, and this is all true. The issue is, though, there are probably much better ways to spend that money to achieve the same outcome.
This is a breakdown of the military budget for a normal year of operation. Only about a quarter of that spending is going directly to personnel as wages. About a third is used on operations and maintenance, which basically means paying for all the ships and aircraft and bases to remain operational. Another quarter is spent on procurement, as in purchasing new military equipment like those ships and tanks and aircraft. And then the rest is broken up between research and development and minor discretionary expenses. For reference, the average social security budget for most developed nations have over 90% of that budget being used for direct payments to recipients. Well okay, but two things of course. The military does need equipment and everything else to remain operational. It still has a primary purpose of being an army. And yes, this is true, but again, we are not here to look at how a military should spend its money, we are discussing if this spending is good for an economy. And the answer for that is... Yeah, but it could be better. The other thing that you might point out is that sure, all this spending is not going straight into military households, but it is still going to companies and contractors that will still need to pay their employees. And this is a great point. But again, the government could, for example, directly pay Walmart to keep a lot of people employed and ugh, ugh. The thing is, there is no reason that giving money directly to a defense contractor is any different from giving that money directly to a private institution or even a private individual as it relates to the economy. The only thing is that it makes it a little bit more politically palatable as not being corporate welfare. If you look exclusively at GDP figures, which in of itself is a mistake, you might see an uptick in growth during war periods because of the intense government spending that goes into funding these military war efforts, as well as rebuilding infrastructure that is destroyed in the conflict. And yes, GDP figures do actually increase during periods of war, but it is a classic example of the broken window fallacy. We have explored the broken window fallacy before on this channel when we were looking at the economics of disasters. In short, the fallacy is such that if you break a window and pay someone $20 to replace it, you have effectively increased GDP by $20 and created a new job. Yippee, good for you. But of course, this is not real economic prosperity, it is just the gauges of an economy delivering silly results for things that were not really designed to be measured by these indicators. In reality, and in a perfect world where we did not need armed forces to defend our nations, there are much more efficient ways of applying fiscal stimulus to benefit both unemployment and the overall well-being of an economy. The problem is though, we don't live in a perfect world, and countries, especially countries like the United States with a lot of foreign interests, do need to maintain a military. So they may as well apply some politically approved fiscal stimulus while they are at it. This is a really, really big picture question that goes beyond monetary and fiscal policy, political ideologies, or even schools of economic thought. What is the purpose of an economy? It's a question that a lot of economists don't even think about as they bury their head into some microeconomic triviality for the entirety of their careers. And that is not to say that there is anything wrong with rigorous academic focus, but all of this must be remembered in the context that an economy is there to supply to the satisfaction of consumers. And this means that a job is only valuable to an economy if it adds value to an economy as judged by consumers. And the truth is, military jobs do not. These jobs do not produce consumer goods or capital goods that can then in turn be used to produce consumer goods. Ergo, they are not of value to the consumer economy. Sure, there is of course some benefit for being safe and having secure borders, but the reality is most countries would be able to achieve this with a far smaller budget. The other thing is that it can actually make an economy worse. Going back to our example of the American war effort during World War II, all of the factories that were retooled and workers that were put to work either overseas fighting or at home making military supplies were not being used for their main purpose. These were factories and workers that would have otherwise been making consumer goods to improve the quality of life of their fellow man, but instead they were making warships to end the lives of their fellow man. Now of course the greatest tragedy of war is loss of life, but even looking at it from the lens of a heartless economist, we can say that those workers that do die and those factories that are destroyed are unfortunately never going to be able to work to add value to the economy ever again. That is effectively years of education and training and expertise that are wasted. 
The purpose of an economy is to increase the standards of living for the participants in that economy, and wars achieve the opposite of this. Another important point to address is that wars are a huge driver of technology. Things like canned food, microwave ovens, and even the internet were born out of the quest to gain an edge in war. So this is true in a sense, but again, it is a very narrow argument. The reality is that these sorts of happy little technological side effects are far from the primary motivator in military research and development. Much more innovation happens in a consumer-orientated economy, where companies are fighting to gain the same kind of competitive edge. Not over an enemy combatant, but rather other companies competing for the same consumer dollars. The other thing is that company research and development is almost exclusively spent focusing on how to improve the lives of other people, rather than blowing them up. If anything, quality of life improving technology would probably be more developed if resources and expertise weren't diverted into delivering slightly better fighter jets. So this has probably all sounded relatively reasonable, if not a bit controversial, but it still can't be escaped that the American economy was in a terrible place before World War II, and then after World War II, it was doing really, really well. So if it wasn't the war, what gives? What actually happened was this. The USA was the de facto leader of the Allies at the end of the war and was able to negotiate things like the formation of the United Nations, and perhaps more importantly, the Bretton Woods Conference. Again, we have discussed the Bretton Woods as we explore the economy of the USA, but what you need to know is that it effectively made the USA the center of the world economy, at least amongst Western aligned nations. The other thing was that the USA was an industrial power that at this time made a good majority of its money through manufacturing, and with its influence amongst its new world market, this manufacturing was very, very competitive on account of all of the factories in Japan and Germany being rubble. The United States was basically able to dictate the terms of the world economy for the later half of the 20th century, and this had much more to do with its economic prosperity than a war of untold destruction ever did. Most economists are not moral idealists that would advocate for completely dismantling all of the militaries around the world because they are bad and don't contribute actively to the welfare of humankind. We know that the defense of nations and the ability for foreign powers to project their influence is something very, very valuable in a non-economic capacity. But fortunately, it seems that most economists and even the public psyche is shifting from the idea that wars are good for an economy. We all want to improve our wealth to live happier and more fulfilled lives. The study of economics explores how individuals, institutions, and nations pursue that wealth and how they use it to achieve their goal of prosperity. Wars that are by their very nature events of massive destruction should in no uncertain terms be confused with anything that contributes actively to increasing wealth or improving quality of life. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please consider liking and subscribing. If you really enjoyed the video, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon like these lovely people. I also fully expect this video to be on the more controversial side, so I want to hear your opinions on the subject, which you can share on our Q&A session hosted on our second channel, or on our Discord server. Links in the video description to hop onto both of those. Thanks guys, bye.